Thank you very much. Uh, thanks again for the organizers. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and thank you all for coming to this talk. Uh, as Robison said, it's a, it's a uh, joint work with Colin and he will, she should be there to answer the chat if any question, uh, of course, feel free to, uh, to raise your hand. Uh, so what, what this paper is about, um, so the, the, we, we, we begin with project that's in the question that Bayesian inferences, which is foundation and something we all do, uh, but there are a lot of observed deviations and, and even Tversky and, and Kahneman call it mistakes or biases. Um, and one observation is, is that it can be too complicated for actual decision makers like myself. Uh, I don't really use space rule all the time when I make all kinds of decisions. And there's a very interesting court case actually here in England that they actually tried to introduce space theorem to jury. And the judge ruled that you shouldn't do that because it will get the jury into some quote, inappropriate, unnecessary theory and complexity. And of course, we're going to uh, appeal to even a higher authority, which is Herbert Simon, of course, say something like, you know, we, if we really are going to be serious about how people make decisions, one way to go, maybe to really model, take seriously limitations on real people's capacities or, or complexity into consideration. So that's sort of the motivation for what we're going to do here. And the thing about Bayesian inferences, but I'm going to put this limitation into the model and see uh, what will come out of that. So here's what we we'll do. We're going to take a Bondi rationality approach, what it exactly means. Uh, you can look at uh, Lubinstein's classical book, Modeling Bondi Rationality. And the idea is to make this decision procedure, decision-making procedure more uh, precisely and formally. And what we like to do is to identify what we will call simple environments. Uh, that would be the environment where patient learning and patient inferences are actually feasible and hence optimal. And I'm gonna change the substantive rationality part. Um, and in that case, if once we identify those, those seems reasonable where patient inferences or standard economic theory, if you wish, will be appropriate for both descriptive and normative use. But what we're really interested in is on what we call complex environments, meaning that these patient inferences are not actually feasible, be too hard for, for our cognitively uh, limited agents. And in that case, what we would try to get is what is a constraint optimal rule look like? And by definition, it's going to differ from patient inferences, and hence will be biases. And the question is really what kind of biases will arise if we do this exercise? And that will give us a chance to distinguish biases that actually optimal response because of cognitive limitation. Again, something you may call genuine mistakes, that mistakes you wish you, you, you expect to, 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 uh, to disappear when people learn and when people realize what's going on. The way we're going to take is going to be very specific, both the problem we take and the approach we take. Uh, we're going to model on the rationality and, and assume sort of this decision proce decision making procedure as a final model. There's actually our new papers coming out to Opria, just have a very nice AER paper that talk about, you know, with this final model makes sense, will be mean by complexity using lab data and actually has follow up paper that argue that these kind of complexity and the way model, we're not the first obviously, seems quite reasonable to think about experimental data. And the context we're going to do, it's going to be a classical patient learning problem the world sequential sampling. So let me just say a few words about what, what this is like and obviously that will be more formal so we can think about sort of this situation when there are two states of nature and decision maker is going to make two actions. You can think about just check into a hypothesis and choose one of them. 
And the main thing about this problem, they're going to sample signals. They never, the decision maker never observed the state of the nature, but only observed the signal along the way. And the key thing here is that it's costly to do so. And hence, what will happen is that uh, even in a perfect rationality case, the province in century finite in the sense that with 451, because the cost of information acquisition, the procedure will end within finite time. Within the appropriate context to think about final to modern, because you, you, if you would have an infinite problem by nature, it doesn't seem reasonable to, to try to have a, a someone who has a finite capacity to solve it. And we'll talk about literature about this, but within this seems the appropriate context for our problem. Um, and one implication you can see later is that because of the finite nature, the e, there are simple environments, simple in our sense, that actually uh, you can implement the optimal learning. So that's sort of something you have a reasonable hope about. And as mentioned, we're going to start the decision maker or more sort of interest is on the complex environments, which will be as well. In fact, most of the environments will be uh, complex. And we want to study sort of the constraint by using the final tomorrow with a given number of states within the final tomorrow. I'm going to be more specific later on. And we're going to assume they're going to use the optimal uh, final automaton given the constraints. So that's going to be the exercise we're going to do. Uh, let me quickly give you a preview on, on what we get out of this exercise. Uh, we're going to get two characterized or two main features of the constraint optimal rules. One is that what we call information stickiness. This is about the given optimal final automaton, constraint optimal final automaton, how it responds to informative signal. It turns out uh, when this memory capacity is binding, randomization is optimal. And the one implication of that is, is that the mental state may not respond to informative signal. It may be the case that some informative signal come the final demand on the decision maker just does not respond to it. In that sense, we call information stickiness. This randomization result is already in the literature, uh, it's fairly well known that when you have limited memory, this kind of thing can happen. What we uh, contribute to this regard is that we actually show in one particular uh, class of information structure where signals are very asymmetric, we fully characterize when that can happen, we can solve for the, the optimal final automatum, which you haven't seen in the literature actually. Uh, but what's really new feature that we identify uh, is what we call rule stickiness. And conceptually is different from information stickiness is about what happened within one single final automatum in one single environment. Rule stickiness is talking about when you are uh, thinking about different environment, but maybe close by environments, what happened to the constraint optimal rule? And this speaking to sort of the, the, the question that come out, especially after Tversky and Kahneman's uh, classical science paper, uh, talking about people seem to use heuristics to respond in these situations. They cannot really do probabilistic reasoning very well. And so the for theorists, one question is what does it mean by heuristics? And these three actually tell us something, uh, point to a definition of heuristics, saying that one single simple rule, when you change the environment, actually it is optimal for decision maker to use the same simple rule for a range of different environments. And here the key thing, the contribution is really to say this is actually optimal thing to do given a cognitive constraint. And we have a very specific uh, simple rule. So the idea is that we're going to, the, the decision maker going to treat signals with similar strengths as exactly the same. And this kind of rule, it, it doesn't seem in fact crazy. In fact, it's very similar to what uh, Benjamin Franklin has been talking about what's called decisional balance sheet uh, actually suggesting that you think about pros and cons for a particular decision and just cancel 
these pros and cons with a proper weight. So it's going to be very similar to that kind of heuristic rule. And here we show that the same kind of rule is optimal for range uh, of environment. So that will be sort of the, the, the sort of the new feature that we identify that not in the literature and we believe speaking to sort of the, what it means by heuristics uh, and that's sort of one thing that we find it interesting. And the other thing that, that I want to sort of uh, advertise a little bit, won't be able to go into too detail. Uh, we're also able to sort of define formally uh, using insight from literature uh, that the belief actually are biased and we can define exactly what we mean by biased belief as well. So, so these constraint optimal rule, although they are constraint optimal, they in fact include a lot of biases relative to the unconstrained uh, decision maker. Okay, any questions so far? We'll just... Okay, I'm gonna be very quick on related literature. Uh, the very closely related paper is a wonderful paper written by Andrea Wilson in 2014, published in Econometrica, where she does it very similar to us, or we are very similar to her, except for they now set in this endogenous stopping time, or in her case, uh, the, exogen the stopping time is the exogenous given, and it turns out her problem is intrinsically infinite. So there's no hope for any simple environment in her case. And, and she doesn't have the real stickiness result, and her result actually lies built upon uh, uh, earlier development by Holman and, and Carver. Uh, and Others, uh, I would just give it for the interest of time. So now let me go to sort of the more formally the setup uh, because the time constraint, I will be able to only give you actually a lot of pictures what the main results are like. I won't be able to uh, I'll give you the formal arguments, but, but hopefully uh, if you are interested can, can look at the paper. So the information structure is very simple. There are two states of nature uh, denoted by theta can be high or low. And there's a prior on high denoted by pi zero. We're going to, for the purpose of the talk, we're going to think about a world with two signals. A lot of results can be generalized to multiple signals that we indicate toward the end. Uh, but for now, just stick to two signals, small h and small l. And as the name suggests, small h is indication of high state of nature, and small l indication of a lot of nature, uh, these are just formalism, but what it says is that when you do patient updating in this kind of situation, it's easier to work with a log like ratio and which you denote by R small h and R small l and R small h is a positive, meaning that they actually are uh, increase of posterior on high and L indicates uh, a, a decrease of the posterior on high. So that's what this is saying. Here's the action and payoff. In each period, the decision maker is going to decide either to wait, meaning that simple more signals, or to take a terminal action, which will be high or low, essentially. And the payoff is intuitive when he get, uh, when he take a high action and the online state of nature is actually high, he gets a positive payoff. And, and otherwise, if you take a low action, you only get a positive payoff only if the state of nature is low. And obviously the DM only observes signals. And one key thing to note is, is that uh, there is a uh, cause of information acquisition and that's because of the discounting. And that, that's sort of the main uh, trade-off for the decision maker, right? and again over whenever action is taken. So this is a very standard and for unconstrained uh, decision maker, what he should do is that he only, his action only depend on, decision to wait or take action only depend on his posterior and only when posterior is on, the ex on uh, either high enough, then he take a high action or it's low enough, he take a low action, otherwise he waits. So this is a very standard and intuitive results. Uh, it might be easier to look at just a picture. Here is the uh, figure on the look like ratio of the posterior and the prior. And the idea is that one in this specific case that requires three high signal to across the boundary to get a high action. 
just to know that this, sorry, just to know that uh, these thresholds actually going to go to positive infinity and negative infinity as delta converges to one, meaning that the cost of information acquisition is very small. So these are all very intuitive results. Any question so far? Then let me go to sort of what's relatively new that we have to implement this with deterministic final automaton. So a deterministic final automaton uh, uh, is essentially a small computer. That's how I want you to think about it. And the way we think about it is that uh, each state corresponding, you think about the state of the mind uh, for the decision maker. And what it does in century is to have in a transition rule that transit from today's, the current state of the mind and the signal you receive and go into a different state of the mind because the specific uh, detail of the problem, we're going to divide this state into what we call updating state, which means that you're waiting or action states which means that you are ready to take an action, obviously QH means that you take action AH, and QL means that you take action AL. Whenever you go to the action state, the process ends. And then you can write on the evolution, depend on the whole history of the uh, uh, signals, then you can just follow the rule, you're gonna figure out what your current state will be, and these are gonna follow a Marco process and, and later on we're going to allow for randomization within transition, but that's going to come. Now then you can define our decision rule is going to be implemented with a uh, finite state automaton M E for any history uh, that uh, this is just uh, indicating the current state after the sequence of signals X. If it's still updating, if and only if, according to the decision rule, you wait. Or if the decision says that you should take a particular action, then you should go to that action state. So that's just a simple definition of what it means by implementable. And here's maybe an easier visual representation of what the final demand is like. In this case, there are Q1, Q2, two states, two mental updating states. And this particular final demand, you begin with Q1, you receive a high signal, go to Q2, you receive another one, you take high action, and whenever you see a low signal, you take the low action. So that's a very simple uh, final automaton. So let me first say our first result. We have two simple environments, which you can actually implement the unconstrained optimal rule that I described earlier by finite automata. The first one is what we call model breakthrough, uh, this says that uh, the low likelihood ratio of low signal is negative infinity or translated meaning that low signal fully reveals the state of nature being a uh, low state. So in that case, what you care is how many high signals you're having. Whenever you receive a low signal, you take the uh, low action and the uh, optimal final model actually looks very similar to the one we just seen in the last slide. The other one that's actually simple is when the log likelihood ratio, remember they go to different directions. And when the relative strength, you can think about relative strength of signal as a log likelihood ratio, the absolute value, when the strength, our uh, relative strength is a rational number, meaning that you know five high signal cancels three low signals, for example. In that case, you can implement, I'm gonna tell you how to implement later, but you can also implement with final model. However, these are the only environments that actually can do that. And our next result says that whenever you deviate from this, essentially, you're gonna get an impossibility result. So here's a formal statement. First, for any given K that you are constrained to use K memory states or K uh, states for the final model, then when delta is high, meaning that the, the threshold, remember, go to infinity and negative infinity, then you can never implement an unconstrained rule by uh, a determined finite state to model. And the reason is very simple. You just don't have enough memory uh, in this case because you're constrained by K. Now, next result is much stronger than this, but require a little more legroom. 
So suppose that uh, uh, you, you delta is not too low, meaning that to cross the threshold need at least two signals on either side. So that's the late run I need. But once you have that assumption, as long as delta is not too low, then generically in the information structure, you can take any probability you want, but generically in the information structure, the unconstrained optimal rule cannot be implemented by any finite state of the model. So it really requires infinite. And this does not contradict the result in the previous slide because the, the two like log like rule ratio, the strength to be rational number is not generic. So that those are the only knife cages actually you can implement with deterministic finite state of the model. Otherwise, the numbers are actually is about not about memory capacity per se, but about the relative uh, strength is too complicated number and actual updating required to know those small differences and fi any final model just cannot handle those probabilities. So that's sort of the, 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 the result that, that we have on the negative part. So now I'm gonna use my remaining seven minutes to look at the, the uh, uh, constraint case and see what kind of feature we get out of this. So we're gonna impose this constraint that Q, the number of updating states is less than or equal to K. Uh, and here we're gonna allow randomization. The randomization is only on the transition probability. So from Q receive X and the probability going to Q prime is denoted by this tau. And the action states remain deterministic that's coming from the earlier result that allow us to do this without loss of generality in this environment, actually. Uh, right, so first let me give you a structure theorem. So there's an earlier paper by Piccioni and Lubinstein that tell us how to do optimization when you don't have perfect memory. And one thing to discover is something called multi-self consistency. And what that says essentially is that you're going to uh, put in doubt each memory state a belief, and that's not going to coincide with the belief from a uh, base rule potentially. And, uh, and these are essentially the posterior, if you wish, that add this particular state. And Essentially, what you do is based on the belief and you look at the continuation value at different memory state that determine which one you transit to. And after a little bit of math, because the monotonicity are in, in this case, give us a structural theorem that says the following. You can think about this as posterior and think about the next state you're gonna transit to it gonna depend upon these thresholds that essentially coming from the, the ratio of the uh, look like a ratio of the uh, value function, difference in value function. And says so that at the Q and X, given your belief RQ, that's what you should be. And given that you, you receive X, only if you go to this interval and that's where you should transit to. And whenever you're going to go to the extreme case to the other side, you take those two actions. So this is a very similar structure to unconstrained optimal rule. You transit to action state only if you're entering so the very high or very low posterior. The only difference is that updating may not be based rule. In fact, we can show, we find a very interesting result. Whenever you have a simple environment where the optimal uh, final to model actually implement the unconstrained optimum, the transition is actually following base rule. Otherwise, it's going to be biased. So in that sense, this generalizes the unconstrained rule. So we can really talk about the belief of bias. So let me now go to uh, these two classes of information structure and talk about what a constrained optimal rule is going to look at, like. Begin with a model breakthrough. The key feature here is that when you look at this is low signal uh, conditional on uh, high state of nature, it never happens. So once it happens, you realize it's a low state of nature. So that's a revealing signal. So it perfect reviews, which means that you should take AL whenever you see it. So the only relevant decision is a number of high signals uh, before you want to make a decision. So 
instead of reading the lemma out, let me just tell you uh, uh, what the finite of the model look like. In fact, in this case, you may be able to implement the uh, unconstrained optimal dependent on delta. So here's a particular case. The delta is such that here is a threshold to get into AH. So in this case, it requires four, one, two, three, four high signals. And of course, whenever you see a low signal, you take a low action. And this is the uh, final the model implement exactly this rule. It says that from this initial, si initial state after four signals, you go to high. Now, of course, the question is, what if this K is not four, but say three? It turns out in this case, the optimal constraint, optimal rule is to use randomization and then randomize everywhere in all mental states. And the, the actual probability, uh, so the idea is that you either, when you receive a high signal, which is informative, with probability alpha, you're gonna stay within your current mental state, and hence you may not respond to the, to the information. And that's the information stickiness result. So here's the theorem, given the constraint K, uh, if delta is low, then you can implement the unconstrained optimal. But whenever the constraint is binding, meaning that delta is higher than that threshold, then we characterize optimal finite state uh, automata exactly as MBK alpha. So this shows that randomization actually is a useful or efficient way to substitute for memory capacity. Uh, and relative to the literature, this is the first result we know that fully characterize the randomized uh, uh, optimal final domata. Okay. So now let me move to the other extreme. So the, in the previous stream, we have a, a, a very symmetric case. Uh, how, many, how much time I have, Rubizo? Three minutes? Uh, yes, you have uh, three, four minutes, yeah. Okay, thank you. So in this symmetric case, uh, it's the same mu here. What that means is that one high signal exactly cancel a low signal. So the posterior only depends on the net difference between these two signals, high and low. So in this case, again, let me skip the formal statement, but just look at the picture, it's easier to, to look at. So you begin with a prior, it requires three high signal to cross to get a high action and require two low signals to cross threshold to get a low action. For this kind of situation, for example, you can use this final automata to implement the unconstrained optimal. Again, Q2 is my uh, initial state. And after three high signals, I get into high action. And with two low signals, I get into low action. And of course, uh, in, the, in the meantime, you may update. And in this case, when the, the ratio between R and JRL, the absolute value is exactly one, this actually doesn't give you any bias belief. Now, of course, one question is that what happened? So let me just be quick and skip the formal statement. Suppose that these two, the relative strength is not exactly equal in this case, a low signal is less strong than high signal, meaning that the, low, the sound low likelihood ratio is not zero, but little positive. Now, the, the difficult question is they can randomize. And will randomize be good? It turns out the result says that randomization is not good, at least for range of the ratio between R and G and RL. It turns out this is still uh, using Q1 as my uh, initial state, is still the optimal thing to do. Obviously, when you continue to do this, meaning that you make the strength of low signal being very small, meaning a high signal come for many low signals, then this 1H canceling 1L does not make much sense. Now, theoretically, you can prove for range, we're gonna use this. And we also do numerical example and to see by how much this works. 
And this particular turns out as long as the ratio between high and low is something between one all the way up to 1.6, the final of the model in the previous slide still work. It's still the constraint optimal rule. What this says is that for a range of complex environments, all this, the constraint is binding. The unconstrained optimal rule will be doing something much more complicated because I'm constrained in a K equal two. These turn out to be the best thing you can do. And obviously when this ratio become two, you don't want to do that anymore. You actually want to, uh, from Q1, you actually want to go all the way to take high signal. So that's become this property equal one, but only for small range, you want randomization. Otherwise you have a rule stickiness result. So again, let me just say that what this means is that for a range of different environments, the same heuristics, meaning that one H cancel one low is the best thing to do. It's, it's the best thing you could do. Okay, so this is related to what we call optimal qualitative probability. I mean that you don't take the property value as its face value, rather you take the sort of the qualitatively what matters. And let me just say one word that we can generalize this to other ratios uh, for nearby ratio. So for any rational number as MH divided by ML, those are prime numbers. Then you can generalize similar results and it goes even to more than two signals, similar result hold. So let me conclude. Uh, what we did is that we identify, sorry, we identify two simple environments. And there are two prominent features. One is for a given uh, optimal final model, we have information thickness. The other ones, we have a rule thickness. And, and I will just stop there. Uh, I will leave the call for, for later discussion. Thank you.